Okay, good morning. Today is uh, August 14th. We are mid-August already, a little bit crazy. And we are, if you have a one-year Bible, we are um, turned to August 14th. If not, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to look at 1 through 8 today, or 1 through 18 today. So just a little bit of a recap, and uh, I know this has gone over and over, so if you've missed some of the teachings, the beautiful thing is you can go back and look at them on our, our um, YouTube channel, but this letter is really the letter from Paul to the Corinthian church, and it really is a love letter, as uh, Olga's sister Lisa taught us. It's, it's the heart of a pastor for a group of people that he loved, but more than that, it's the heart of our God for his people because it's he's the good shepherd and it's the heart of Christ for people and when you love people and um one of the things that you want to do and this letter does a lot of this this was a letter that was in response to a letter that had been written to him with a bunch of questions but this letter really um was designed to help these men and women that Paul had shared the gospel with in the city of Corinth and spent a number of years helping them grow in the Lord. You know, you guys spend a year here with us and we form relationships with you and um, hopefully those will last for years, but they're centered around Christ. And just like someone taught the disciples, Christ did, he came and he walked and did life with them for at least three and a half years. Uh, they learned about him. They learned who he was. They t learned what his word said and they learned how to put it into practice, into everyday life and everyday examples. And then he told them, you guys go do the same. You guys go make disciples. And so they would do that. They would teach the word. They would live with people. And that's really what happened in my life. I had uh, someone share the gospel with me multiple times. And we always talk about the people that planted seeds in your life. But I also had Debbie who devoted her life to, well, not her whole life, but part of her life to walking alongside of me and doing life with me for years and years still, right? And that's what these discipleship homes do. And this is what Paul was doing. And so you you care about these people. And just like a parent, think about a good parent. I know some of you didn't have great parents, but a good parent will teach. This letter was designed to teach them things, to help instruct them, right? Because you need to be taught. It was designed to encourage them in the good things that they were doing, in the growth that they were having, in the things that were praiseworthy and just encourage them. He was going to instruct them about things that they didn't know. Like you can't teach a kindergartner everything right away. You, you instruct as they go, right? A good parent or a good pastor or a good shepherd will also correct you when you're headed in the wrong direction because they don't want you to hurt themselves yourself. And sometimes he had to have what was called a rebuke, a really sharp, like, let me kind of turn you over in my knee and say, what are you doing? But even that was because he loved them and he needed to get their attention in a pretty clear way so that they would understand that they were making decisions and choices that were not only hurting themselves, were impacting others, were breaking trust, and were hurting the heart of God. And we're going to put them in danger. And so there was a strong rebuke to some of the behaviors that they had, right? And people get all offended, like God is love. Yes, but love corrects, disciplines, rebukes, as well as encourages, instructs, and then leads, Right. They talked about Christ being the authority in your life. They talk about discipline, right? Um, he also began to really talk to them about purity. And we talked about having the big girl class. We talked about a lot of the moral conflicts they were having. We They talked about the idea of God's design for marriage, um, what it looked like to be single, what it looked like to be pure and why. And we really kind of understood that God created us and he knows how he made us and how we work the best. And he knows what works for and, and how he um, made us. And he said, this is, this is how you were designed. 
I was your creator and I'm your father who loves you. So I'm going to share with you. And he talked about, and Lauren did a great job of really talking about purity, um, not having sex before you get married, being pure in your commitment to Christ and being pure with your body. That's now his temple and what an impact it has. And so we always, you know, sometimes you hear that and you go, gosh, I've blown it. <laughs> you know? Like I know where I lived and all the things that I did, but that's when you really have to understand the magnitude of God's grace, where he says, yes, such were some of you. Some of you were full on drunkards. Some of you were fully sexually immoral. Some of you were murderers. Some of you were, you know, um, liars. You were thieves. You were all those things. That's what you were, but you've been washed. You've been cleaned and you get to have, you've been white as snow and you get to have a do-over right? Which is crazy, but that's what he says. And so now responsible from here. So just powerful. And then he talked about your rights in Christ. When you come to Christ, you're no longer under the law, right? You don't have to obey to get into heaven. You don't have to get the rules right, but your obedience becomes an act of love. It becomes an re act of response to Christ. And so you've been given some grace and you've been given some freedoms. It's not thus saith the Lord, you have to do this. You have, But he says, but you should ask the Lord and you should not let the freedoms that you might have stumble someone else. And so really, he we did a great job yesterday, but he talked about that idea of the self-life a life that's about self and my desires and what I want, which we learn from other scriptures in Romans that it leads to destruction and the Christ centered life. That's about serving God, loving God and loving others. And that's the life where you find joy, where you actually find some happiness. And he talks that, you know, the self life keeps you bound you continue to stay bound and you're not finding freedom. The Christ-centered, other-centered life is where you're going to find freedom and joy. And yet we, that's so hard to get our brains around, right? Which would require dying to self. So he did tell us yesterday, there's one God. I'm the only God. I'm the creator. I've been since the beginning. There are lots of little gods and things that people worship, right? He said, but those are idols and those aren't true gods and they're going to destroy you. And he said, so and he said, so please, please look to, please look to me. And that's kind of where we left off yesterday. Um, Paul was really saying, listen, it, you have some rights in Christ. You have some freedoms. Now, they're not freedoms to sin. He's not saying you have freedom to sin. He says you have some liberties and things that are not directly called sin in his world. And um, he said, but those freedoms should never be exercised if they're going to make somebody else stumble, you should lay those down. Um, and so today he's going to pick up a little bit further. Um, one of the things that they had received in his letter was people had come in and they were questioning Paul's authority as an apostle. Okay. They're like, we know the apostles and he wasn't one of them. And where's his authority? Where did, where's that come from, right? Paul's authority. And the Corinthians were listening to these things that were being said and were beginning to have doubts about his authority. So Paul's going to answer some questions here. He's going to ask some things. So in Acts or first Corinthians chapter one, um, He's going to ask some questions. And when the word of God asks questions, is it because it needs to know the answer? Why does he ask questions? Why does God's word ask questions? To show you. To show us things, to get us to think, right? And you can hear Paul. Sometimes I love reading this because I'm like, okay, he's got a little sarcasm in him, right? He's got that little gift of sarcasm, but it's always used to help them think because he does love them. So in verse one of chapter nine, am I, Paul, not as free as everyone else? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus with my own eyes? Isn't it because of the, my work that you, along, you belong to the Lord? Even if others think I am not an apostle, 
I certainly am to you. You yourselves are proof that I am the Lord's apostle. So questioning, is Paul an apostle? Paul writes back to them and he asks them questions. First thing he says, am I free? Listen, Paul was set free. Remember, he was a Pharisee. So he was set free from his legalism, from the law. He was also set free from sin, right? We remember he was free to walk in God's grace and um, set free from the law so that he could now respond to Christ in love, right? You guys got to get this. We get set free from having to obey, to be approved and accepted, to being loved and accepted while we were still sinners and died for. And because of that, our, we're compelled to want to obey Christ for love's sake, right? That's a true mark of a disciple. If you truly love me, you will obey. If you read in John, he says, if you love me, you will obey. You will obey me and you will obey my father. If you don't love me, you will not obey. So your obedience to Christ and to his word and to those that he puts in authority is a direct show to God that I love you and I belong to you. So he says, am I free? Um, Paul was set free. Am I an apostle? Right now, apostle was the word means sent one. We've talked about that. But in their culture, the apostle was also an apostolic office. There was 12 disciples. They were apostles. Judas ended because Christ not only discipled them, but he sent them out. And it had an apostolic office and it had, had some weight with it. It had some authority with it. Judas, right, left and they, anoint, they appointed somebody else, but God had a pick. God was like, I didn't need you to fill the office for me when Judas left. I had a man that I saw, and he was born later because he came in Acts chapter nine when Paul had his personal encounter with Jesus Christ, okay? And he asked God two questions when God got his attention. Who remembers what they are? Who are you and what do you want me to do? Who are you, Lord? First question. Who are you, Lord? Reveal yourself to me. You. And he said, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting, right? He, and then he says, what would you have me do? And I love those two questions. And I feel like you could spend the rest of your life answering those two questions. But he was called, he had an opportunity on the road to have an encounter with Christ. And he asked him who he, are, who he was. And Christ said, I am Jesus, who you have been persecuting and then he said what would you have me do now if you go back and read acts chapter 9 and i always suggest that you spend some time there because it really reminds me of this of renew of discipleship paul had an encounter with christ where god got his attention and he said who are you lord right and he said i'm jesus who you've been persecuting right and then he was blind and he went and he sat for three days. And I think about when you come here and you sit and you start to recognize who Christ is and he starts to reveal himself to you. And he says, I died for you and I paid a price for your sins. And it's not just a story. And I've pursued you and I've brought you here. And then you start to sit and you start to think about your life and you start to think about, I'm sure Paul sat there and went, I killed his people. I persecuted them. I hurt them. And he just rolled the tape of all the sinful things. And you guys know that when you come here, you do that for a while. And initially you feel horrible and sometimes you want to run. But then that should really help you understand. Like that's part of the process, really recognizing how you've sinned against God and how your sin has affected others, not to make you feel shame and condemnation, but to recognize the shame that he's taking, the condemnation that he doesn't want you to feel and recognize how amazing his grace and forgiveness is. If I don't understand what he's forgiven me of because I haven't ever acknowledged my sin, then I am not as grateful 
right? So Paul had those moments. And I just was thinking about that. Paul has said, and I thought about the difference because then the scales came and fell from his eyes, but he talks about having seen Jesus, right? So I was thinking about this a lot because he heard first, right? And we know that concept of faith comes by hearing. He heard a voice. He didn't see someone, but then he got his sight. And then later on, he's like, I've seen Jesus. Like I've seen him. And some of you are like, like, I, I haven't physically seen Jesus. It seems like Paul did, but I see Christ in all kinds of places now. I see Christ in my life. When I first started this journey, I was just hoping to hear his voice. I was talking to someone yesterday and she's like, I'm beginning to hear him. I'm beginning to hear his voice, right? And so hearing comes first. And if you listen, right? And we, my pastor Remain always said, if you want to hear his voice, read his word out loud. We, we heard his word read out loud in Ezra today. And they heard the voice in the heart of God. This is the voice in the heart of God. This is him communicating to you, giant text message from the sky. You can hear his voice by reading his word. It's really about if I listen. So I was thinking about that. And I remember Job 42, five, who did I give that to? My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Job says this, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And I just want to encourage you, the more you listen to God's word, the more you hear it, the more you recognize it as the voice of God speaking to you directly, as it him sharing his heart, him sharing instruction, him sharing warning, him sharing correction, and you listen and you obey you will begin to see him, right? Not I see an uh, aberration of Jesus, but I see Christ. I see the spirit of God moving. I see him in other people. I see his hand. I see his response to prayer. I can look in and I can see him. And that's what God wants for you. And I was really thinking about this today because what happened with Paul on the road to Damascus is what needs to happen with each of us right? First of all, you have this encounter with Christ, you hear him. And then you begin to decide if he's going to be your savior, right? And there's salvation. Uh, Paul said, who are you, Lord? And when he accepted who he was, that he was Jesus, that he was the Lord, then he sat in that darkness and he considered and he made a decision, right? And he said, I am going to receive you, right? I'm going to receive you as my Lord and Savior. And then I'm going to submit to your Lordship. And I'm going to do what you asked me to do. And then God commissioned him. He said, okay, I've been waiting for you because I created you for something. And now I have a job for you. This is what I've created you for. And so I just want you to hear this. I'm going to have, I think I gave it, who did I give Acts 26 to? Me. Okay. So listen, I want you to hear Paul. This is when Paul was going to, and we've talked about this before. This is when Paul was um, sharing his testimony in front of King Agrippa. And let's listen to what he says. Would you read um, 12 through 14? Because I want you to see the journey. Here's the encounter that he had with Christ. Listen to what he says, 12 through 14. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. Are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Okay, hang on. I lost my spot. Okay. Acts 26, 12 through 14. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go. While thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission from the chief priest at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
It is hard for you to kick against the goads. In his journey in life, doing what he thought he was called to do, Christ intersects his life in a powerful way. And he has intersected all of your lives if you're here, right? He's gotten your attention. And that's what he did. They all fell off their horses and he heard a voice, right? And that's the beginning of his journey, hearing the voice. And he calls him to repentance. He convicts his heart with these words, Saul, Saul, Peggy, Peggy, why are you continuing to sin against me right and then i have to recognize right that that's what i'm doing i'm a, i'm sinning against the god of the universe right now read 15 through 18 right Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me and tell them that I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by the faith of me. Here's what he said. Who are you, Lord? Right. And he says, I'm Jesus. And they settled that. You are my Lord. And he says, now stand up. If I'm your Lord, stand up. And he commissions him. He said, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. I'm going to ask you to tell them about the light of Christ and you're going to help turn them. I have a job for you to do. He says, if I'm your Lord and if you have settled that, I have a job for you, right? This is what I created you to do, right? Stand and here's my plan for your life, right? Um, read 19 through 20 now. Here's Paul's response. And so King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven. I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove they have changed by the good things they do. Some Jews arrested me in the temple for preaching this, and they had tried to kill me. Okay, here's what he says. He said, God called me to do this. And I, can, and I responded, I submitted myself to the call and I did what he asked me to, okay? So I really want you to get that. You should go back and spend some time there because what happened, right, was he had the encounter. He chose to acknowledge who God was and to make him the Lord. He hurt, surrendered to his will for him because it's not just to forgive me it's what would you have me do and he commissioned him right and that's what he's asking you to do that's what this is all about here right and ephesians uh, luke 174 says he you've been saved from your enemies from sin and from your enemies to serve god the one true god because you're going to serve something but you've been saved from sin, from idols, from your enemies to serve without fear, because you walk in grace, not fear, in holiness and righteousness all the days of your life. You've been saved to serve. That's what you were created for. Ephesians 2.10 says, I created you for good works. I have a plan for your life. Yesterday, someone said, I'm afraid of my future. I don't know what it is. I feel like I'm free falling. God's like, I have a plan for your life. If you will allow me to be your Lord, this is what discipleship is about. This is what you're doing here. I'm spending a lot of time on this because I really want you to get what he's saying. Paul went on to say, I've seen the Lord with my own eyes. I'm sharing with you. I started by hearing his voice. I started by choosing to allow him to be my Lord. I started by acknowledging that he had a plan for my life and that I was going to submit to that plan. And he commissioned me and sent me, not equipped, didn't feel like I could, but I did it. 
And I have not shrunk back. I'm doing what he's asked me to do. And the Corinthians were part of that journey. Okay. Because Paul did not shrink back because Paul did what God called him to do. The Corinthians heard the gospel and got saved. Uh, you guys know, I just went to Maine and was at that cure conference and uh, I spent most of my time there just super squishy, like super emotional <laughs> because what I saw was I remember in 2004 getting in my car in California to go serve God, not feeling equipped, not knowing what I was doing, not knowing why he would pick me and just saying, yes, Lord, okay, you've asked me to go from San Diego to Maine, I'll go. I remember the early days of in a two bedroom apartment and praying for furniture and praying for a girl to come and praying for God to do a work, right? I remember six girls, seven girls in an apartment with two bedroom apartment with me and my pit bull and one toilet. I remember all of the warfare with the lesbian Wiccans upstairs and all of the warfare and wanting to turn back and wanting to quit and then just holding on to God, lonely, fearful, right? discouraged, holding on to Jesus. And then I sat and watched the fruit of what God did in my life and through my life. Like there, we took a picture and there was hundreds of lives that had been changed. And all I did was say, yes, Lord, right? And God would have used someone else if he didn't use me, right? But I got to play a little bit of role in Emily's discipling people and Isaiah 54 says that my descendants would start to inhabit cities and Lauren is and Emily is and girls are because they are disciples of Jesus Christ now and they are doing this and God's got a call on their life and that's how this works and I never could have seen there from yes Lord right but I want to encourage you because he has a plan and a purpose for your life. Now, he says to them, even if everyone else might doubt my apostleship, you guys should know because you, I shared the gospel with you. You're here because of me. But he said, right, um, you yourselves are proof of the Lord's work that I'm an apostle, that God sent me, right? Your fruit that came from me being obedient to Jesus right? He's not claiming that he grew it. God's the vine. We're the branches. Any fruit that comes just comes because we're connected to the vine, right? But Paul's like, what are you kidding? I mean, that would be like you guys later on going, do you really have any authority? Like, are you really a disciple? Right? Can you, do you believe in Jesus? Wait, we spent a year with you. You'd come to know Jesus because we shared the word with you. Like, this is what was going on. They were questioning. But who does that sound like? Casting doubt. The enemy of God. Satan's in it, right? Second Kings, right? Where Sennacherib writes that letter and you see the plan of the enemy. Second Kings 18, where he says he causes fear. Did God really say, can you trust him? Can you trust Hezekiah, the leader? Is he really God's servant? I know God better than you. And of course, any time that there's fruit, that there's discipleship, that the word's going forth, the enemy shows up and casts doubt. And they cast doubt on God's authority, on who God is, on God's love, on his authority, and on the, and the, the leadership of people that he brings into your life. And he wants to separate you from them and think that they don't have your best interest in mind. So I can imagine how hurtful this was for Paul. Like sometimes to, like I was like, oh my gosh. And I've had this happen, right? I've had this happen where people are like, someone got in their head and told them that this was a cult and that I had no discernment and that I was Jezebel. And you just are like, okay, right? But it's hard because Satan wants to discourage you and he will use whatever he had. Please hear me. You guys have to take the same journey that Paul did if you really want to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And if you are, God's got a plan for you too. But it starts with your own personal encounter, your own personal decision 
Is he my savior? Will he be my Lord? Will I recognize that he has a plan for my life and will I desire to walk in his plan rather than mine? Will I submit to him? And then will I let him use my life to serve us? That's really the choice here. That's what a true disciple is. And that's what a true disciple does. So you really get to decide if that's, if that's what the journey is that you're taking. And if you, it, if it, if you is, right, if you are, I promise you, you're going to have a life that's full of joy and has an impact for God's kingdom because we're not just living for right now. It's about eternity because heaven and earth are going to pass away and everything in it, everything is going to go. But God's word is going to last forever. You cannot take anything with you, but you can send treasures on ahead. You can send things. If you give someone a cup of cold water in God's name, there's a treasure for you in heaven. Right? And then there's this, getting to stand in front of Jesus and have him say, well done, good and faithful servant, not perfect servant. But when there's nothing else, when there's no people to please, when there's no ladder to climb, when there's no fortune to make because this world has passed away, when there's no education, smart thing to do, when there's no more relationships to find and you're standing in front of the God of the universe, I like, all that's going to matter is, what did you do with my son? And were you faithful? Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in, enjoy, right? Sit, dine, right? I just want that, like I, like when I, and that's hard to get your brain around because the here and now and the stuff, and it doesn't mean you see Abraham had the money, Moses had stuff, David had stuff, Solomon had stuff. It doesn't mean you don't have any earthly treasures or enjoyment, but you have the right focus. Okay, really long time on this first part, but I want you to see the journey. I hope you got that. I want you to see the enemy. Now, when we get to chapter verse three, here's what he says. This is my answer. He's going to answer the questions, right? And um, to those who question my authority, don't we have the right to live in our own homes and share your meals? Don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us as the other apostles do and the Lord's brothers do? And as Peter does, Peter had a wife, or is it Barnabas and I who only have to work to support ourselves? Okay. Answers. The question here is authority. Authority, right? I like to look up words. Authority, power or the right to give orders or make decisions. Moral and right control. So who has the power or the right to make decisions in your life, to give directions and orders, not suggestions, right? Mm -hmm. um, to demand and enforce obedience. Somebody in authority is supposed to enforce the obedience. We read through Romans 13, where that's the legitimate role of authority is to punish wrongdoers. Right? So who has authority? Because um, who's the boss of me? Because Romans 6 tells us someone's going to be the boss of you. Either sin unto death or the spirit unto life. Your flesh unrighteousness or righteousness you're going to serve someone you get to choose who you serve we say that all the time so there is you do have a master and i don't know who it is but you get to choose it you either choose the one true god and let him be your master or you continue being your master or you let satan lie to you and tell you things and you believe him or you let drugs or alcohol or relationships, like something's going to control you. You get to decide who it is. Someone's going to run your life, right? I was talking to someone yesterday who's like, oh, right, control my life. I surrender. But I had to get real with myself at 36 and go, I've been in charge of my own life 
you know, when I was a kid, but for the last 18 years, 19, 20 years, right? And the best I could do was this. <laughs> like, and I'm not a dumb woman. If I could have figured it out, I would have done it different. Now, maybe your life wasn't as messed up as mine, but if you're here, apparently something wasn't going right, right? And so the smartest thing you can do is choose to let God, who loves you and is a good shepherd, direct your steps and let him use people to help you, right? Who's the boss of me? Um, wrote Matthew 28, 18 says, all authority is Christ. It's been given to him. He's in, he is the boss, whether you choose to acknowledge it or not, right? This is the truth, whether you submit to it or not. And just because you decide to not believe it doesn't mean it's not true. Right. So I just want to encourage you. So I was really thinking about this um, because, uh, you know, Paul gave authority to the Lord that day on the road to Damascus. He said, you're you're going to be the Lord of my life now. God says, OK, let me tell you what I have for you to do. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to go to the Gentiles, right? And Paul said, I will do whatever you ask, right? Everywhere, Paul calls himself a bond servant. He calls himself a servant by choice. And so Jesus himself was submitted to the will of God, to his authority. He did what God the Father asked him. The disciples made a decision while they were walking with Christ, that they would surrender their lives to him and live for him. That's what a disciple means. I'm going to discipline my life to follow you, right? And I made my choice. I remember the day where I said, I'm going to not only believe in you, and thank you for saving me and forgiving me, but I'm going to surrender and give my life to you. And I'm going to live for you. And I'm going to do whatever you ask me to. It was a full surrender moment. I remember where I was standing. And I'm going to let you make the decisions for my life. And then he brought Debbie into my life to help disciple me. Because that's what he does. He brings people alongside of you to help you walk that journey. Right? Hebrews 13, 17. What does that say? Obey your spirit, excuse me, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they know they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this joyfully and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Okay. Hebrews 13, 17 is very clear. It says, obey the spiritual leaders that God has brought into your life. And that obedience is a decision. It's a, if you've decided to follow him first, right? You've surrendered to him and you trust him, right? You can then trust the people that he's brought over your life as long as they are following Christ, right? Some spiritual leaders are not. But he says their role is to look out for your souls. He's called them. He's commissioned me. He says, I'm going to ask you to shepherd these little girls, these ladies, not little girls, these ladies, but I'm going to ask you, you're, you're supposed to be, look out for their souls, which means what you teach them better line up with my word, what you reveal to them, right? Better be aligned with my word. He says, you choose to obey them because that's what they're trying to do. And guess who I answer to? Not you, God right? And he says, do it willingly because you've submitted to me and because I've asked you to do it so that they don't have to punish you. So that it's, they don't have to be grieved because you are disobeying. He said, this is how it's designed, right? He gave them Paul, right? So um, I just also, so I was thinking about that because I was thinking about who has authority in my life? Right? Right? Write down who's got authority in your life right now. If you're in Renew, it's probably me on some levels, right? But who really is making decisions for you? 
who is God making decisions? Are you still planning things? What's moving you? Are you motivated by your future, by your desires? What's running your life right now? Who's the authority in your life? Who do you allow to correct you? To disciple you, discipline you? Does, does God's word have that access? That's a question you should ask yourself. The next thing he talks about right here is his rights. He lists some of the rights that the office of an apostle had, right? He lists some of these rights. They had the right to have a wife, but it had to be a godly wife, right? Peter had a wife, right? Um, but he also had the right to stay in their homes. There was an expectation of an apostle, of a rabbi showed up, that they could stay with you and you would care for them while they preached God's word. And most of the time they didn't work. They just, you cared for them. That was part of what you were doing because you were receiving a benefit. And he said, but these are rights that Barnabas and I chose to lay down because we could have had you support us, but we chose to support ourselves. Paul didn't have a wife anymore. We don't know why. Either she left him, right? Because he got saved, who knows? But he's like, I have some rights, but these are some rights that I've chosen to lay down because they make me more effective in ministry. So that's another question you might ask yourself. What rights do I maybe have according to God's word, or I think I have, and maybe I should ask him, that I might want to lay down because it would help me be more effective in serving the Lord, right? Drinking is a right that I don't really have, you know, and I don't even want to pretend I do, right? But every once in a while, my head says, you know what, I can probably have a glass of champagne and not end up drunk like I used to. I could probably have a glass of wine, but it is, and God's, it's a right that I will never exercise because of the fact that it won't help me in ministry. If you think it will read Proverbs 31, she's telling her son, don't, don't do it. Right. And some of the other areas of scripture and Proverbs, but it also would be stumbling. So what rights could I lay down that would make me be more effective or maybe for a season while I'm hanging out with other women who don't have that right, what right could I lay down? Right. So I just want to move on from here really quick. Now, I know we're almost out of time and I have a lot more to share, but I'm going to go fast. Um, seven through um, ten, Paul says he's going to go on and he says what soldier has to pay his own expenses. Right. We don't expect a soldier to go to war and have to pay for his bullets. What farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't expect to eat some of its fruit right out at the farm they eat the vegetables right you don't think that a farmer can't eat from his food what shepherd cares for a flock and can't drink some of the milk i'm express am i expressing merely so he's he's kind of giving you questions to make you think and the answer to that is none of them right we would we wouldn't expect if i had a garden out back that i couldn't eat from it right? You wouldn't expect if you had a, a, a herd or something that you couldn't drink the milk or eat the beef, you know, like he's, he's trying to help you understand. He said, and I'm not just having a mere human opinion. That's what the law says. And he quotes to them Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse four, when the law of Moses said, don't muzzle an ox to keep it from eating when it's treading out the grain. When the ox used to go around, they would let the grain would fall and he was treading the grain, but you don't put a muzzle on him so he can't eat because if he eats, he's going to keep working. He's going to keep doing what he says. He's like, don't muzzle the ox while he's doing the work. Let him partake of what he's getting so that it could encourage him to keep doing the work right? So it's a biblical principle. And he's really asking you to have some wisdom. He said, was God only trying to teach us about ox? No. Wasn't he actually speaking to us? Yes. It was written for us so that the one who plows and the one that threshes the grain might both expect a share of the harvest. This kind of shares a biblical principle with you. And tomorrow you're going to get into, and I'm jealous that Lauren gets to teach it of one of my favorite sections of scripture, because it's like, hey, Everything in here is for you to have examples, for you to get some wisdom that you cannot just take 
you can take and apply to your life. You can see what happens when they did, and you can see what happens when they didn't. You can take a look, and when you're thinking about oxen, I'm not just expecting you to consider oxen. I'm expecting you to apply common sense to your life, right? And so there are a number of scriptures where this principle works, right? Where Paul, John, Peter, people sowed into their lives spiritually and there was an expectation that they could partake of some of the practical things while they were doing that work, right? When you get to 1 Timothy chapter 5, you're going to read the deacons and the elders and the pastors while they're helping you, while they're serving you, give them a double portion, like you bless them because they're sowing into your life, right? Um, he talks about in Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes, the kind of life you're supposed to live, a blessed life where you give, where you hunger, where you thirst for the Lord, where you give to others, where you, you apply God's word. And then in Matthew 23, right, where he, he rebukes a bunch of Pharisees who were making the law a heavy burden, He's like, I'm trying to show you how to do this right. I'm trying to instruct you and teach you and grow you in the Lord so that you can become disciples of Jesus Christ so that you could be free. He said, since we planted some spiritual food among you, aren't we entitled to eat some of the physical food and drink? If you support others who preach you, shouldn't it be even greater for you to support us? But we never use this right, Paul said. We would rather put up with anything than be too an obstacle to get the news. Here's the deal. Planted seeds, shared the word with them, obeyed God because he would spiritual growth. Debbie planted some seeds. Jackie planted some seeds in my life. I am eternally grateful to them because I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be saved if someone hadn't shared the gospel with me, pursued me and discipled me and showed me what it looks like. Right. I will do anything for those women, right? Debbie has invested her life for me. I will do anything for her, right? Because I, but I will do anything for the Lord that he asked me, right? And that's this concept too, of this idea of giving back, right? Now I will, I've had, I will never ask for practical things from people. I get blessed all the time. But I don't ever want, like them, I would rather j just not expect anything than, and just do God's work, right? He's like, I don't, I don't want to ask you for anything. I don't want to take those rights. I just, I don't want it to be a stumbling block because Satan always comes in and twists it. If I could tell you, if I could have a dollar for every time that they say, they just bring you there so you can be their servants and slave at the farm and clean their church. Yeah, that's what we're doing, right? But I would encourage you to really consider this, that when people or ministries, right now you're not in a place, but if this ministry has sown into your life, the way that it's supported is by people donating later. And when you can, right? Sow back into the ministry that helped you, into the shelter, into Renew, into Blessed Hope, into other women's lives, man. I want you to sow into other women's lives. Right? Most of the time, some of you guys are here is because someone sent you here because God sowed into their life. And that's how it works, right? So I just want to encourage you. He goes on and he says, don't you realize that those people that work in the temple, they get to eat the meal. Those that serve at the altar, they get to share the sacrificial things, taking them back to the word. God always provided for them. In the same way, the Lord ordered those that preach. He's talking about Old Testament principles. Now he's bringing it into New Testament. Those of us that are preaching the gospel to you, we should be supported by those who benefit from it. It's just a principle. It's a God principle and it makes sense. You see it. Yet I've never used any of these rights and I'm not writing to you now to suggest that I want to start. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge. Yet preaching the good news is something I can boast about, but I am compelled to do it by Jesus Christ. Um, so 
I wish he goes on and he keeps, he's just building a case. He laid a very practical foundation. He helped you understand it in practical ways as a farmer, as a soldier, uh, you know, he helped you understand it. And he says, and spiritually, because people were saying, Paul's just using you. Paul's like, no, I am an apostle. I laid down my rights. It doesn't mean I'm not an apostle. I didn't require those things of you because I wanted to give you the gospel for free. Right. It's a really interesting thing. My friend Josh that I just spent some time with him and his wife, uh, he came out of the men's program in Maine, him and his wife, he married a wife who wanted to be a missionary and they went to Africa. Okay. Started their life in Africa because God called them to preach the gospel there. Mike and I went, when they first started, we took a team of women. They were in a little room about this big. They had five people and a guitar. Fast forward, I don't know how many years later, but he's got one of the biggest churches. He's got God, Franklin Graham's just giving him land. They're starting houses for orphans because there's so many over there. They're building another new church because they can't keep the amount of people. But here's what happens in their culture. This is what he came up against. Any people were coming over to share the gospel, but they were charging the Africans. The Africans have no money. They were bringing lambs and things and they would put on their suit because every African has a suit. I don't know why. Right. But they got a suit because it makes them feel important and they pay money because you think if you pay for something or if you're charged for something. And here Josh was giving the gospel away for free and he didn't want anything from them. And that's hard to get someone to accept. Right. But Paul says, I can, you know, he kind of is like, I like the bragging rights that I can say, I didn't take anything from you. And sometimes I do that. Like, I don't want nothing. I, you know, I just want to do this for the Lord. Right. But he says, I can't even really brag because I'm compelled by the Lord. Right. I can't not. Right. I think I gave somebody Jeremiah 20 verse nine. Who's got that? Did I give that? Yes, just one minute. Okay. When I speak, no, but I but if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak in his name, his word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I'm worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. Jeremiah said, listen, when I try, because every time he opened his mouth and talked about the Lord, it didn't go so well for him. And he got tired of doing it. And he's like, I'm going to quit. And he said, when I tried, I couldn't even do it because the word of God just burned in me and I couldn't contain myself. And when I tried to keep my mouth shut, because we have the answer, you have salvation, you have the answer, you know, Jesus right? He said, God put it in me and it's like a fire that burns in me. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.12, what does that say? I'm sorry. Yeah. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Yeah. I didn't wake up one day and say, this is my job. I thank God because Christ counted me worthy. I'm not worthy of myself. And he gave me this ministry. He put me in this. He called me to do this, right? I'm compelled. I have to. I wouldn't have life if he didn't give it to me, right? John 10, I gave someone 11 through 13. Here's what Jesus said. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep. God's trying to tell you, I am the good shepherd, right? Um, I'm not trying to destroy your life. I'm trying to give you a life. Um, I think I ran this out of order, but that's okay. First uh, Peter 5. One through four, who's got that? I do. It says, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, 
not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject. Oh, you wanted one to four, sorry. Okay, so First Peter like, chapter five is the apostle Peter sharing. And he's saying, hey, I'm an elder. I'm I, just like you guys. I'm someone who submitted to God and God's called me to this position. And what he's asked me to do is shepherd the flock that's a shepherd God's flock. Because you guys are God. And I want you to have an influence, right? And you're like, Peg, I'm not going to be a shepherd. You're going to have an influence on other people's lives. He said, I want you to do it willingly. I don't want you to do it for personal gain, right? I'm a good shepherd and I love these sheep. That's why this letter got written. That's why God's trying to tell you this. Tomorrow when you read, he's going to really try to warn you. Please, please pay attention right? He goes on and he says, if I was doing this of my own initiative, if it was just my will, I wouldn't deserve payment. I would deserve payment because I put it in it. But I have no choice because God, and this is, I read those verses before, God gave me the sacred trust. God put me in the ministry, right? Everywhere Paul calls himself a bond servant. I'm a slave. I was a slave to sin that was set free and now I have chosen to serve a good master, the good shepherd. I'm his bond servant. I'm an apostle by the will of Christ, right? I'm alive because of the love of Christ. He has a job for each one of you. Paul's like, this is what he's called me to do. And I'm just doing it, right? And he says, he put me like, I have to do this because it burns in me. I have to do this because I'm committed to Christ. He counted me worthy. He put me in there. He wants to give me life and life abundantly because he's a good shepherd. And then he's asked me to shepherd others with the same heart, right? And so that's the, the journey here. He says, what is my pay? What's my pay? My pay, it's the opportunity to preach the gospel without charging anyone. That's what I get to do, he says. That's why I never demand my rights when I preach the good news. Let me read this to you and then we'll finish up here. Sorry, I'm going a little over. First Thessalonians chapter two. Listen to Paul's heart. Read verse four through six for me, Drew. For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted, to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. Okay. Paul writes a letter to the Thessalonians and says, here's my job, man, is to share the gospel. And I do it because he asked me to. I want to please God. I'm not interested in trying to please people because they're, they're never happy. He said, but he's entrusted me with the key, with salvation to the good news. That's what he's doing. Okay, now read seven and eight for me, Drew. As apostles of Christ, we certainly have the right to make some demands of you, but instead we were like children among you, or we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. He says, listen, I had some rights as an apostle. Apostles and rabbis had rights. They could come in and do things, but I didn't exercise those rights. I laid them down. And instead of coming in and demanding things, here's what I did. I came in and he said, I cared about you like my own children. And I didn't just share the gospel with you, but I shared my whole life with you. I just did life with you, right? And it wasn't like something I got paid to do, right? It was something that they were people I invested in. That's what Jesus did. He didn't just come teach a class on salvation and how to walk with God. He did life with those men. He walked a journey with them. He cared about what they cared about. He struggled. They knew their struggles. And that's what God calls us to do. And that's what Paul did, right? Then 9 through 12, what does that say? 
Don't you remember, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you? Night and day we toiled to earn a living, so that we would not be a burden to any of you as we preach God's good news to you. You yourselves are our witnesses, and God, and so is God, that we were devout and honest and faultless towards all of you believers. And you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. We pleaded with you, encouraged you, and urged you to live lives in the way that God would consider worthy, for he called you to share in his kingdom and glory. He said, hey, you guys know how we lived among you. We tried to do our best to live according to God's word. We treated you like sons and daughters, and we did encourage you to walk worthy and do the right thing because we loved you, right? He says, that's what we did. This wasn't something Paul just did with the Corinthians. This was his model for life, right? This is how he did life. This is how he made disciples. And this is what he did. And this is the heart of God for you. Now read um, verse 13. Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received this, his message from us, you did not think of it as our own words, as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very words of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. He said, God, I thank the Lord that when you heard our words, you didn't go, oh, those are great words from Peggy or Paul or Peter or Lauren. But you said, okay, God's talking to me. Those are God's words. He's speaking. He's using them to speak to me. He's using them to illustrate them to me. And you allowed them to change your life. And that's the deal. Paul goes on in chapter three and says, you're my crown and glory, that you're standing firm in Christ. He said, that's my paycheck. Is that now I simply shared God's word with me and I became a disciple and now I'm sharing God's word and that you've made that decision, right? Powerful, super powerful. So um, quickly, because we're out of time, but the Old Testament today, if you did not get a chance to read it, Ezra, Nehemiah, Ezra, and this letter, they're all going together. And I want you to understand, if you step up like this, you're going to see God's really trying to show you some things. And in the Old Testament today, right, it's the same journey that they had to take in the New Testament, just a little bit different. Because what happened was Nehemiah is rebuilding the temple and they ask Ezra the pre or e rebuilding the city. And we talked about rebuilding our lives yesterday, right? And you start to do that and the enemy is going to try to come against you and tempt you and, and defeat you. Ezra had been building the temple. And when they got that stuff done, they said, could you get the book of, can you get God's word out? And can you read it? And they had this day where they all came together and they got the word of God out because they understood that it was given to Israel, God's people, so that they would obey it. That's what, what why he gave you the word. So you would obey it. So it would bless you, right? And so they read the word all day long, like from noon for like hours, early morning into noon. They just read the word out loud, right? And the people listened. It was pretty powerful. And then Ezra was up on this platform and he was reading and he stood in full view of the people and the people stood up as the word was being read. And then they would stop and they would praise and they would worship him and they would fall down on their faces. And then guess what happened? The Levites, some of the priests and the Levites would step in and they instructed the people in the law while everyone remained in their places. They read the word of God and helped to clearly explain what it meant because they didn't always get it. And they helped the people understand each passage. That's why I love Calvary. They teach each passage. That's why we do this. And that's the goal is like, you're hearing the word. You don't always get what it means, but the God's going to take people that have been walking longer and know the word more to help you understand it, to explain to you what it means. I'm blown away sometimes when people don't have any questions, when they're not struggling with anything, when they don't, wonder what they should do that lines up with God's word right and so here you see that helping people understand I don't know what I would have done without Debbie helping me understand the word and apply it to my life right and then you see that there was no separation of church and state the governor Nehemiah and Ezra the priest they came together and they told him listen today's not a day of mourning 
Remember they had sinned and they were messed up. He said, today is a day that you're going to celebrate because God has called you back. The word has been shared. There's a, a path. He said, don't be dejected because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Okay, I really thought about this. Don't cry today because here's your reality. As the word has gone forth, they studied the word and they discovered it. And we can rejoice because even though we sin like they had, remember they had married the wrong people. They weren't serving God. They were doing, even though we sinned, God is not done with you and he's drawn you to him. He's revealed himself to you. And the day of the Lord was the day of the cross that they were looking forward to, but that we have already had that he's died for your sins, right? So you don't have to mourn. You can receive the forgiveness, right? And that's what he said. I want you to celebrate. I want you to worship. Don't cry right now. Partake of partake of Christ, partake of the cross, partake of what he's done. And then the next couple of days, they read more. And the more they read in God's word, the more they discovered and the more they learned. That should be your journey. The more you learn, it should move past salvation. It should move past milk. Jesus loves me. You should get to meet. You should begin to grow. They recognized that there was this thing called the festival of shelters, and they did what God told them to do, and they lived in these shelters, and they rejoiced, and they had this joy. And when you start doing what God does, asks you to do, and living according to him, your lives are going to change, and there's going to be joy, right? Now, later on, there was a day where they came together because now God had revealed the truth of his word to you. It had been read. It had been explained. They had thanked the God for forgiving them, for they had started to do what it said. And then they had the hard part where they had to actually fast and pray because it was time for them to really repent of their sin. And they had to confess their sins before the Lord. And they weren't laughing about it like, oh, we sinned. <laughs> they were mourning because we've sinned against the God of the universe. And we're ready to change. And they confessed their sins and they stood there for three hours as the word went forth and they confessed their sins and they worshiped God. And then they put away their wives and their relationship. They left things. Now, please don't think God's mean. He didn't want them to pull them away. So if a wife or a foreign wife or a husband wasn't willing to convert to honor the God of Israel, he said, you're going to have to walk away from that. And other people were hurt because they sinned. But that's not fair. Why would God ask him to do that? He never should have been in that relationship. It was going to hurt them and hurt those people. That's why I asked you, right? And it may feel bad to hurt them, but when we sin, it does hurt our relationships, right? And then he goes on and just this prayer is powerful. You guys should at some point read it because it is so powerful. And it's you alone are God. You made everything. You chose Abraham. You chose a man. You chose, and when he proved faithful, okay, he chose you. And when you prove that you're going to submit and be faithful to him, you, he makes a covenant with you and he's going to bless you and he's going to promise you. And he never goes out of your prom off on his promises. He goes and he shares the story. And again, you're going to read it tomorrow. But he heard their misery. He did miraculous signs. Some of you are here in a miraculous way and he's always doing miraculous signs. He parted the Red Sea. He led them by a pillar. He, he spoke to them from heaven. He instructed them. He commanded them. He gave them Moses to be a servant, to obey them. He fed them bread from heaven. He met their needs. He did all of this stuff. He commanded them. He promised them land. He saved them out of their bondage, right? But your ancestors were proud and stubborn and they did not pay attention to my command. They refused to obey and did not remember the miracles you had done. They got stubborn and they decided to point their own leaders or be their own leaders, not to submit to God or to the ones that he wanted to. Um, and they got went back into slavery. And that's what I watch happen here a lot. And I have to, you know, God has to watch it, but I have to watch you go, I won't let you be the Lord over me. And I won't listen to people that you're using to lead or guide me, God. 
I want to run my own life. And he says, okay, I'll let you, but it's going to result in you being in slavery again. You can't not, right? So he just goes on and talks about the gracious forgiveness of the Lord. And he said, but even when they screwed up, he sent his spirit to draw, draw them to him. And there, you sent your good spirit to instruct them. And he's willing to forgive and have you come back. He says, you sent your good spirit to instruct them. And did, you did not stop giving them bread from heaven or water. And for year, 40 years, you sustained them and they lacked nothing. It's the Old Testament version of what God's calling you to do now. Same thing. And he's warning you about what will lead you back into bondage and what will give you truth. Okay, that's your study. Sorry, I went long. Shannon, will you see what Rick needs at the door? Let me stop this recording.